My name is Ilana Queen. I'm a professor of neuroscience and society in the Department of Psychiatry, and we work closely with colleagues from the Lucian Center for Nature Recovery on nature-based mental health and flourishing. So that's why I'm uh, here to yes. um, introduce Professor Miles Richardson, uh, professor of human factors and nature connectedness at the University of Derby, who founded the award-winning Nature Connectedness Research Group, which aims to understand and improve the connection with nature, um, importantly for the good of humans and for the good of nature. So that's something that we're also very interested in in our flourishing program. His book, Reconnection, Fixing Our Broken Relationship with Nature, was published in April 2023 and is actually available in the atmosphere room for signing and purchasing. Um, after this talk. So we're really delighted to have you here. Thank you. And um, and thank you. And we're going to have about 45 minutes of um, a lecture and then a Q&A to follow. And then you're all invited to the reception afterwards. So. Uh, thank you very much. That's very kind. And uh, thank you all for, for coming along. Nice to see so, so many people. Um, yes, um, that's me, Miles Richardson. Uh, you can follow my work. I'm still um, um, sticking with Twitter for now, um, but you can see my um, blog address there um, where I post things pretty pretty regularly in a longer format. Um, well, that's uh, well, I just switched itself off, so I'll go for that. Ah, we're now there. It's gone to sleep while you've you thought you'd done all your work. All right. Okay. Uh, well, there we are. I could have worked that out, I think, just about. Thank you very much. Yeah. So um, I've structured the the kind of talk around the book, but obviously there's a lot more content in the book than I can fit into 45 minutes. Um, so it's split into three bits. Uh, the need for reconnection with nature, the benefits um, of reconnecting with nature, and then the big question, I suppose, how, how, do, we, how do we reconnect people uh, with nature at, at scale, at a societal scale. Um, on the three sections, I've put some little things that I found out wrong, right in the book, which was some of the things that stuck out to me um, that I didn't know before I started. Um, so our broken relationship with nature. So I kind of start out s saying the sorry story of our broken relationship with nature. So I see um, climate warming, the loss of biodiversity, the mental health crisis as well as symptoms of that broken relationship or failing relationship however you want to term it with the rest of the natural world um the four minutes 36 is just one indication from a study that we did in sheffield where we gave um well we had to persuade almost people to download an app um, that tracked them through the thousand green spaces in in sheffield and that four minutes, 36 seconds was the medium, median amount of time people spent in a green space each day. So we're very detached physically from the natural world as well as psychologically. And this, I've just put these up because I came up with the biodiversity stripes and it's just another representation of the failing relationship with nature. So 69% uh, loss of biodiversity going by the LPI index and they're Ed Hawkins climate warming stripes, so matched year for year. So in my lifetime, um, there's been a been a change from uh, blue and green to, to red and gray. And I see another symptom of our disconnection with the natural world by the amount of money we spend funding research to show that nature is beneficial to, to humans. There's decades of research that that um, explores that and um, we're starting to be accepted now that the natural world is is good for people but we would never question whether a fish needs a river or a bird needs the sky or a, a gorilla needs the forest and i see that as a kind of dis sign of our symptom of the disconnection as well um another sign is the use of nature words in cultural products so this is just a chart of the appearance of nature words in english fiction um, it's a little bit old now, but it, it shows the last century, basically. And the, you can see the, the dip in usage of nature words, particularly trees and flowers, 
um, since 1950. And the analysis that they did suggested that might be introductions of technology. So as, as new waves of technology came in, nature featured less and less in cultural, in cultural products. And people have done the same in, in books, films, um, and uh, song lyrics as, as well. So you kind of get a similar uh, lack of reference to nature in uh, cultural outputs. Um, and then this is just another little chart to kind of illustrate how things have changed. Again, the green line there is just the, the LPI global index, 69% loss of biodiversity since 1970. And then the red line is just a, a Google engram of the frequency of the use of the word me since 1970. So you can see since the kind of late 90s, the use of the word me has gone up very steeply. And that's captured nicely in that cartoon by um, Ralph Underhill there. And another graphic, if I've not hammered home the point enough yet, is um, this, this isn't our research. This is um, a figure I created from the, the data in the global biomass of, of wild mammals in a paper that was out earlier this year. Um, so just another um, sign of the, 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 the human dominance of life on Earth. Uh, so humans by weight, our cattle and livestock by weight, our pets uh, are the same now as the wild land mammals in, in, in mass, and then obviously the marine ones as well. And I'll introduce what nature connectedness is um, in a couple of slides time, but this is a measure of nature connection. I'll explain what that is. And this is a league table of, of these 18, I think, nations that have had a survey of the level of nature connectedness of a, a, I think it was a thousand people in each of those countries had their nature connection measured uh, in a project at Exeter University. Um, and there's a league table there of biodiversity as well and well-being. And you can start to see the relationship um, where the UK in particular is at the bottom of that table, it has lower levels of nature connection, lower levels of biodiversity and lower levels of well-being. And I think it's just interesting how I've grown up thinking that we were a nation of nature lovers and you hear of our green and pleasant land and we celebrate our nature documentaries and you, we celebrate the poets and the artists who depict the natural world. But we're one of the most nature depleted countries on the planet and um, our level of nature connection, our relationship with nature is particularly weak as well. So it's not a very encouraging story. Um, thankfully, there is signs now over the past few years that some major global institutions are starting to recognize that the route to a more sustainable and biodiverse, biodiverse future requires a new relationship with nature. And that terminology is uh, seen more frequently now in um, releases from the uh, UN Convention on Biological Diver Diversity, the UN Environmental Programme. The Stockholm Plus 50 is a UN commissioned um, evidence report that was out last year. Um, the agreement from COP15, Target 12, I think, refers to connection with nature. And the um, European Environment Agency briefing from earlier this year is interesting as well, because that talks very much about our relationship with, later and, uh, with nature in quite a kind of spiritual, psychological way, um, as does the Das Gupta review as well, actually. Um, it's a few years few years old. It's interesting with the Das Gupta review, it's 600 pages long, and it's got quite a lot of content on our spiritual, psychological relationship with nature. But in the summary for policymakers, that's all gone, and it's a very dry kind of um, recommendations. So in the book, and this isn't my area, um, I, I read a lot about um, anthropological evidence and, and the like. So I really enjoyed doing that and trying to take the long view of how we as a species have come from being embedded in the natural world um, and getting our existence from a, a very embedded relationship um, 
with the rest of the natural world, perhaps not even see, seeing the fact that there was a kind of natural world because we were so embedded within it, to a point through the agricultural and scientific and industrial and technological revolutions where we now live our lives mainly indoors, as we are now, surrounded by our technology. Um, and the natural world is very much in a box that's other, that's out there. And obviously that natural world is, is suffering and in decline. Um, and as a technological ape, we, we're, we're one of the great apes and we're defined by our technology. Um, that's got us to where we are now. We like to use technological symptoms. So we're looking for greener ways of consuming stuff, uh, greener ways of creating energy. And we have, um, maybe not so technical, but we focus on the symptoms and we're restoring habitat and restoring, restoring nature. Um, whereas I, as I say, I see those as symptoms and the cause is our relationship with nature. So we still need to treat the symptoms, but we need to think about restoring our relationship as well, because that will be the, the make those technical solutions more successful and it will be a, a, a longer term strategy as well. Um, so a little bit depressing, I suppose, at the moment, our disconnection with nature, but there's some very um, almost magical links that remain latent within us to the rest of the natural world. And these are just a few examples. If you um, put the right sensors on people and measure their heart rate variability, for example, and place them in a woodland, sat on a chair in a woodland, um, you can detect the changes in physiology as the nervous system calms. Um, and that same effect where nature is helping balance our moods and regulate our emotions. You can find that as well in a laboratory setting. If you ask people to view a bunch of roses for three minutes, you can get those same physiological uh, markers and traces come through as you would if you were sat in a woodland. Um, similarly, if you blindfold people and put them in a laboratory and ask them to put the palm of their hand on various materials, um, when it's placed on untreated wood, you get the same effect. So the, the body knows when it is in contact with natural materials, which is, kind of, I don't know how, perhaps some people here do, but I don't, uh, quite remarkable. In Sheffield, we asked people with the mobile phone app in the green spaces to rate those green spaces for biodiversity. Just members of the public, no training, they could estimate the level of biodiversity quite accurately, surprisingly, in a ranking type of way. So we've kind of got this innate ability to, to notice where's more biodiverse and less biodiverse. Uh, the microbiome, microbes there, just that little, little graphic, um, that reflects the research that shows our microbiome is healthier in people who grow up in uh, near urban woodlands and near a woodland setting, for example. And similarly, the amygdala in the brain, which is involved in our um, managing our emotions, that there's research that shows that's uh, better formed in people who grow up near, a, near a, a natural environment. I think, again, that was urban, urban woodland. So you kind of got these innate physical connections. Um, and that leads us on to us nature connectedness, which is our psychological connection with nature. And I think that's a false barrier as well. There's kind of no divide between physical and and psychological, but when it's the same kind of fracture almost that separates us from the, the natural world. And so it's different to contact and exposure to nature. That's the key thing. Nature connectedness or nature connection is the kind of informal term, is our sense of relationship with the natural world. And it can be cognitive. It's a belief. I am part of the natural world. I'm part of the wider ecology of the natural world or emotional and it's, I um, got a strong emotional bond to the rest of the natural world. And we can use psychometric scales to measure that. And we do. Um, and once obviously you can measure something that allows you to do some science and you can do cross-sectional research to find out a bit more about what's happening with, if you're more deeply connected with nature and you can start to do intervention studies to see if we can improve people's relationship with nature. And we've found that although it's quite traity, 
you can uh, bring about sustained Im improvements in uh, nature connectedness. Um, and obviously there's been decades of research into people's relationship with nature broadly. Um, I think this psychological construct has taken off because it allows um, the science, the facts and figures that convince um, policymakers and decision makers and the like. Um, so it's gone from, there was a single journal article that used the term in 2001. Uh, there was 72 used it in 2013 and there was 1400 last year. So there's been a very steep uh, rise in the research in that area, starting to show that it's perhaps a basic psychological need. And the exciting thing for me is it unites both human and nature's well-being, which I'll come on to. So hopefully um, there's a sense that nature connectedness matters and we've got a broken relationship with nature. And then we can look at the benefits of reconnection, which is one of the justifications for trying to, in, to improve it and to see whether that makes any difference. And that's just one of the, the other um, facts and figures I found out while researching the book that I, I was quite blown away by. Each person is a community of half human and half microbial cells um, but the, mi the microbes have obviously got quite a bad rap and we buy products to kill 99% of uh, germs and all that. But most uh, microbes aren't um, bad for us. Many are integral to our health. Um, and you find more pathogenic species in an urban sports field as you would in a woodland, despite a, a, a woodland having many more um, diversity of, of microbes. So we move on to the health benefits and broadly a stronger bond with the natural world is related to feeling good and functioning well. So feeling good, you can work it out from the, the, the words on the screen, there are things like vitality, happiness and the like. Functioning well, it's high levels of feeling your life is worthwhile, uh, personal growth, meaning and purpose, so that kind of deeper eudonomic um, well-being. And in a cross-sectional study that we did uh, back in 2016, I think, with Natural England, um, we found that the level of nature connectedness was four times more important in explaining eudonomic well-being, feeling your life is worthwhile, than socioeconomic status, which is a, a bench accepted benchmark measure. And nature visits, which is often focused on, um, wasn't significant in that. There's obviously other health benefits to nature visits, but on, particularly on that worthwhile life measure. So it's quite interesting. When you start to measure connectedness rather than visits, you start to get a more nuanced picture of what's happening. And you get some other interesting uh, benefits as well, like pro-social behaviour and, and uh, improved body image for people with higher levels of nature connectedness. And then on the other side or the same side i should say of the benefits to the the, the natural world um there's been enough research now for systematic systematic reviews the systematic reviews two systematic reviews on the, the, the health benefits and there's two systematic reviews now on the pro-environmental behavior um benefits uh, which have found a strong and robust link between nature connection and uh, um, pro-environmental behaviors um including some evidence of a causal link as well. So this is just to highlight the difference again between exposure to nature, which is good for us, being out in green spaces and um, going to the park has, has health benefits. Um, but if you're actively engaged with nature, repeatedly noticing and enjoying nature, um, you get perhaps slightly different, maybe more benefits, and the benefits have a start to have a reciprocal relationship uh, where it's good for nature and, and good for you. You're, you are more likely to give back to nature as well. So on this kind of little journey through what nature connectedness is, when we measured it across um, the UK, we found this teenage dip in nature connectedness. Uh, others have found it now in um, Canadian, Chinese, and Australian populations, I think, similar dip. Um, 
So it starts out high on this is the and this is on the NCI. There's about 12 scales you can use to measure it. This is one of them. Starts out high, goes from it goes up to 100 or high-ish. Um, and then drops quite starkly down to when people are 13, 15, and then slowly goes back up towards the national mean. And everybody knows, um, everybody in the room will have been through their teenage years. Other things um, start to matter then. Peer-to-peer -peer relationships are very important. You start to learn to, to manage your um, emotions in, in a kind of more adult setting, I suppose. And nature perhaps takes a back, back seat. And that green line is very speculative. And it's based on the next slide, but I've just kind of put that in as perhaps that's where we need to get to for a more sustainable future. So just to help explain the relationship between nature connection and pro-nature behaviours, um, that study again that I've just um, shown you, the, the mean across the UK population was 61, uh, which doesn't mean a great deal on its own. But for people who reported in that survey, they did nothing with the environment. They don't recycle. They do nothing. Their mean NCI was 47. For people who said they recycle, don't do anything else. It's quite easy to recycle. It doesn't take much effort now because we have all the, the, the bins and, and what have you. Uh, their mean NCI was 63, so a little bit higher. Um, but for people who reported that they're actively involved in pro-nature conservation um, volunteering, for example, it rose up to 76. So there are people who are, are kind of really getting involved in that work. So you can start to see where you've got that relationship in a, in a reasonably simple way. Um, another thing that we've done is look at pro-environmental behaviours and pro-nature conservation behaviours. It's a bit odd. It's, it's similar to the, the, the press coverage um, on climate and biodiversity. So until recently, um, climate has very much dominated. I think it gets eight to 10 times as much coverage as biodiversity loss. Um, it's starting to change a little bit. Um, and from a psychological perspective, a lot of the research has gone on pro-environmental behaviors, those positive inactions that are related broadly to carbon and resource use. So don't drive, don't fly. Um, we couldn't find a scale on pro-nature conservation behaviors. So habitat creation broadly, it could be in your could be in the wider domain or in your own personal domain if you're fortunate enough to have a, a garden to do that sort of thing in. Um, so we've developed a pro-nature conservation behaviour scale because we work quite closely with um, the, the nature conservation NGOs and they wanted to measure that. Um, and we found that they are um, different types of behaviour. There's different kind of psychological aspects when you when you start to look at the, um, the data. Um, and we did some work on that with the National Trust. So we did a, a survey of uh, adults in the UK. We used the, this, our new pro, pro COBS, we call it, pro-nature conservation behavior scale. And we looked at how nature connectedness, time in nature, tuning in and noticing nature uh, and indirect engagement with nature, nature books, for example, and programs, knowledge and study of nature, which often gets quite a lot of emphasis, valuing nature and concern for nature and pro-environmental behaviors explained people's pro-nature conservation behaviors. And what we found was all of those factors together explained 70% of people's positive actions for nature, which is a high, a pretty high figure. Um, but the most important contributor was simple, simply noticing nature. People who noticed bird song and noticed butterflies flying around tended to do more for nature. The amount of time they spent in nature wasn't uh, um, significant. The knowledge and study of nature wasn't significant. Their values and concern weren't significant in that where every, all those factors were in together. Uh, and the level of nature connectedness was, was very strongly related. So you can start to see how that relationship and active relationship as well uh, is really important if you want to get people involved in pro-nature conservation behaviors. And this slide doesn't particularly fit in the flow, but it's while we're kind of vaguely talking about uh, measures of nature connectedness, uh, this again is from that multi-nation um, um, survey across 18 uh, nations. We looked at uh, nature connectedness in those countries and the 
uh, relationship to well-being and biodiversity, which you saw on the table earlier. I just thought it was interesting that if you looked at those countries' sustainable development rankings, you got the opposite relationship. So the more, uh, the higher up the sustainable development ranking were, they had a negative relationship to biodiversity, perhaps because they're trying to recover biodiversity. It had a negative relationship to well-being, which is interesting, and a no negative relationship to nature connectedness. So it's just to illustrate that it's quite a good metric to aim for to try and improve those levels of nature connectedness. So just kind of coming towards the end of, of that section on introducing nature connectedness and why it matters for human and nature's well-being, um, that's kind of the research over the past 10 years or or so. Um, just a few highlights from 2023. Um, it's, it's difficult to know whether our relationship with nature has been getting worse. The, the, the use of nature words kind of indicates perhaps it does because we've got to, we can track that over time. But there was a nice systematic review done earlier this year that showed that people's psychological and physical connections to nature have been declining over time. And that was a global, a global study. So it's nice to have that confirmed. Uh, it's not a nice fact, but it's it's good to know that that's the general uh, trajectory. Um, and the benefits of nature connection are starting to get through into the conservation community. So there was a, a journal in conservation letters um, suggesting that uh, human nature connection was, was a useful direction, but it's yet to become mainstream in practice. And similarly in uh, biological conservation, a systematic review uh, that noted that it, the benefits of nature connection for human health and nature's health, um, but it's neglected by current public policy. So there's not, very little policy that's aiming directly at improving that, uh, which we'll come on to a little bit uh, later. Um, so the decline in nature connection is real. It matters for human and nature's well-being, but sadly is often overlooked. Um, so the kind of final third is how do we go about creating a new relationship? So hopefully you kind of um, can see in the evidence that perhaps it is a good thing. Uh, it's good for people and it's good for the natural world. How do we, how do we improve it? Um, and I started off doing some very simple interventions, which I'll cover briefly. And then we're kind of trying to scale them up to think, um, how do you do those at a societal scale? And there's another another thing I didn't know. I, I, obviously, I'd heard of the term survival of the fittest. I didn't know that Darwin apologised for using it, apparently. Uh, and he used the, the word love 90 times, I think, I read in The Descent of, uh, of Man. So it just shows how the survival of the fittest was a term that suited the, the age and has suited decades afterwards. Whereas... He was talking more about relationships and it's relationships that perhaps make the world go round. Um, so if you're trying to improve nature connectedness, a lot of people turn to education. Um, this is only one study, but there's been a systematic review that's, that's confirmed uh, pretty much the same, that environmental knowledge doesn't feed through to ecological behaviours. So this is just one study. I pick it because the numbers are, uh, are, are quite stark. Um, explaining 2% of ecological behavior, um, but nature connectedness explaining 69% of ecological behavior in children in this, in this instance. So where I started out in 2013, um, I'm an engineer by, engineer by background, so I like solutions. So I started off with an intervention, oddly, that didn't, um, uh, we did. We were doing all the work at the same time, but I, I wanted to develop a simple intervention that perhaps could improve nature connectedness. And I took a twist on the the noticing, well, the noting three good things a day intervention, which is the positive psychology intervention you may have heard of. And I just added in nature onto the the end of that. So at the end of each day, write down three good things that you see in nature. Um, when people did that for a week, we found sustained increases in nature connectedness. Uh, and in another study as well, we found significant increases in, in mental health as well that were sustained for a month. And for people living with a mental health condition, those, those were clinically significant improvements as well. Um, and we've done two or three studies using that three good things in nature approach now. 
And we've also most recently combined it with citizen science approaches. So um, doing the fit counts or butterfly counts, for example, getting people to do them, and then seeing if they impacted on well-being, nature conservation behaviors, and nature connectedness. And we found um, doing the citizen science did help with well-being, and it did help with nature connectedness. Um, but if you added on the three good things, so you ask people to count, but then kind of consider and reflect on the good things, the nature connectedness improved a bit more and the pro nature conservation behaviors improved. Weirdly, although people were doing the citizen science because they thought they were contributing, it didn't make a difference to their pro nature conservation behaviors. But when they were noticing the good things in nature at the same time, they did report that. So it's quite an important thing to to, to combine the counting with the calm and joy that nature brings and just simply prompting people to notice the good things in nature does have a, um, a powerful effect. Um, but the trouble is, um, most people don't notice nature. So again, in this work with the National Trust, 80% uh, of people rarely or never watch wildlife, um, don't listen to bird song, uh, smell wildflowers and, and, uh, and the like. Uh, and there's eye tracking evidence as well um, that shows that um, less connected people tend to look at buildings rather than trees if they're in an urban environment, for example. Um, and in the lockdown, uh, coincidentally, we started, or the Nat Natural England started measuring nature connectedness and noticing nature in March 2020. So we were able to have a look, a look at uh, those survey results. And we found that visits to nature went up. We'll all recognize that because. That was the only thing you could do. Um, but noticing nature increased even more. And when we looked at um, what was explaining well-being and pro-nature conservation behaviours, which was also in that survey, we found that it was the increases in noticing nature rather than the recent increases in visits that were explaining well-being and pro-nature conservation behaviours. So the trouble is, if you asking people to notice the good things in nature, it, it's not gonna to lead to any systemic societal change. You can promote it as a good thing to do. Um, so we've also developed a design framework, which we call the Pathways to Nature Connectedness. Uh, and those pathways are basically buttons to press. So organizations, this is widely used, that the, the National Trust adopted it uh, pretty early pretty early on and there's dozens of organizations use it now that are engaged in uh, kind of human nature engagement programs and the buttons that you need to try and build in to those programs are sensory contact uh, appreciating the beauty of the natural world noticing the joy and calm that nature brings celebrating the meaning of nature in 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 your life so those kind of deeper moments with nature that you might reflect on in art or poetry or or um, songs or, or whatever and giving the opportunity for people to care for nature as well in that research that came up with the pathways it was based on the nine values of biophilia from uh, a long time ago kellett's values from 1991 um, those are the five types of activity that did explain a close relationship with nature these are the four that didn't and so similarly the um, scientific relationship with nature wasn't explained in nature connectedness, so a purely scientific uh, one. Uh, and then, as you might expect, the utilitarian practical use um, didn't, the dominionistic control and dominance of nature, and obviously nature can be very dangerous as well. So um, the negativistic aversion from uh, and fear of certain aspects of nature wasn't related to a close relationship with nature, which uh, as you'd expect. But as a whole, you might look at those as pathways for survival and progress rather than a rounded and sustain, sustainable relationship with nature. And we've just done a paper that was out in sustainability in, in August, and we compared interpersonal relationships with human nature relationships, and we found many parallels. And I th like to think of the human nature relationship is the same as any other relationship that we might might have in our personal lives and work lives like elsewhere in life a lasting and sustainable relationship comes through noticing emotion finding beauty meaning and 
and compassion. Um, so I mentioned the pathways have been quite widely used. Um, 30 Days Wild, if you've heard of that, we help, we work with uh, the Wildlife Trusts and the initial activities that when that launched in 2015, 2016, I think about a million people took part in the first five years. So we looked at taking part in uh, 30 Days Wild and that improved um, nature connectedness as well, which is good. The National Trust adopted, it, as I said, so the revamp of 50 things to do before you're 11 and three quarters. We worked on that that was um, released uh, Easter 2019, I think. Um, we've been working on a biophilic school um, and government programs like Generation Green and Green Influencers use the pathways as well as within their kind of training materials. Um, and it's also started to be used in the design of places a little bit. Uh, so like the Durrell Butterfly House is 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 one example. And that's where we're trying to start to think about how do you de design an urban space that activates those pathways to nature connectedness in this effort to try and scale it up, to start thinking at a societal scale, how do you improve nature connectedness? So I've tried to summarise that in this simple way. Um, our current failing relationship is based on the on the red arrow, the use, control, consumption, uh, relationship with nature which which dominate which dominate um and then we need to try and improve the the do more of the activities and have more of the, the relationships in the green arrow so fostering closer relationships more engagement noticing enjoying celebrating caring for nature uh to increase nature connection and then hopefully um make my mental well-being pro nature behaviors pro environmental behaviors so you've got that journey to a more sustainable and worthwhile life. And we start to look at um, transformational change theories as well in that and, and the importance of leverage points and creating visions and opportunities and actions for people to get involved with and how you feed back on how that engagement is, is being a success. So that's the focus of a lot of what we do now. And I just wanted to return back to this data again, this is from the table, same same data from that table, because um, this helped us look at the big macro factors that might be affecting individual levels of nature connectedness. Um, so this, you can see along the bottom, nature connectedness uh, there, and then well-being as well. Um, and you can see um, the UK is near the bottom for nature connectedness and near the bottom for, for well-being, but I've drawn a circle around those and I don't know if anyone can, nobody's going to offer to speak, but if anyone can notice anything about those uh, those countries, Hong Kong, United Kingdom, US, Australia and Canada uh, and Ireland, um, perhaps there's something to do with with the, uh, the, the former parts of the British Empire and a, a relationship with nature that we perhaps exported. I don't know. It's just interesting to reflect on. But when we looked at the factors in those countries that related to nature connectedness of the individuals, we found that wealth, the more wealthy a country was, the lower the level of nature connectedness, um, the level of technology, the more technology there was in a country, the smartphone, present, uh, um, smartphone use, for example, the lower the level of nature connectedness, the higher the level of biodiversity, the higher the level of nature connectedness, which you might expect. Land use was a big factor. So the more pasture land in a country, the lower the level of nature connectedness. And obviously there's a lot of pasture land in the UK and, and Ireland. And as you might guess, urbanization, the more the more urban areas, the lower the level uh, of nature connection. And children, unfortunately, the more the younger the age of the population, the less connected it um, to nature it was. And perhaps that's a sign of the shifting baseline. If biodiversity matters, the, the if you've got more older people, they might have had more engagement with nature through their lives and that spreads through the population that's that was just we, we haven't gone any explored any deeper than those relationships so it suggests for example um with children there's a need to look at education perhaps and the way our schools and the aims of of education um and this is where you start to do the green arrow and think about leverage points so we want to place our effort where we get the most return. 
but from the Leverage Points research, that's Don Donello Meadows from 1999, she died a few, few weeks ago, 99% um, of the effort goes in the lower, weaker Leverage Points around parameters and standards and lots of debate getting those through. Um, but we tend not to change the aims and values. For example, the aims of education. If you go to the DfE website and look what the aims of education are in this country, you won't see mention of sustainability or anything environmental. But you would have thought um, at this time with the environmental crisis, that was a, a critical thing to do. So thankfully, those reports, those global reports are starting to take notice of the nature connectedness research. So the Stockholm Plus 50, for example, um, recommended using the pathways to design education policy and curricula, for example. And that's just one. Um, these are references to our, our work um, in policy documents. You can see a couple of dozen have been used uh, and cited in, in many times across many policy bodies in 12 countries, which is, which is great as a researcher. But the, an interesting aspect is the four main areas of interest are the relationships to well-being, to pro-environmental behaviors, pro-nature conservation behaviors, and how you do it at a societal scale. So you can see that um, people are, or bodies are trying, are starting to take note of, of the research in this area. I've got a few minutes left, so I'll quickly draw to a, a close, which I'm kind of nearly there. Um, this isn't related to the book. I, I kind of put these in because um, I formed the Nature Connectedness Research Group 10 years ago. So it was kind of 10th birthday this year. And that's always a point to reflect on what's happening. Um, and looking ahead to 2033, perhaps, and whether we'll have nature first communities and nature the first step to well-being or education that puts nature first. And I threw together this, this chart of everything that we've done. And I kind of thought I'd leave it in because as a lot of researchers in the room and perhaps a lot of researchers at, at an earlier stage in their career, and it, it just highlights how the research is quite an insignificant, not an insignificant, it's a small part of everything that we do and how that understanding is part of it. And then you go to the applying and then you go to the sharing and then you go to the scaling up. Um, and we've done that in four areas around the new relationship with nature, mental health interventions. We could do loads more on that, but we haven't got the capacity or the, the, the funds particularly. Um, so the, the, our in, interventions were part of Mental Health Awareness Week in 2020, in 2021, for example, and they're used in the RSPB nature prescriptions and the like. And then the pro-nature um, theme of our research is, is starting to take off as well. Um, and I mentioned visions. So we've just, we held our first event in June on gathering people together to try and create a vision of a more nature-connected society in, uh, in 10 years' time, we used. Um, and that was a really interesting process. And that would be, we'd like to repeat that. We repeated it with people who were like us, researchers and uh, practitioners in the area. We'd like to go out into communities and, and, and create those visions of what a nature connectedness society might look like. Because it, it's really empowering and, and enjoyable thing to, to get involved with. Um, so that's my very quick run through what's happening. There's lots of further information together obviously there's the book but that's a that's a that's a big long read there's easy to read guides on my blog uh the mental health foundation report uh is really good actually we have a mooc if you want to do a mooc um we've got the nature connection handbook which is very easy uh to read for over forty thousand downloads we we released the nature connected organizations handbook on monday i think that's had two thousand or so downloads already we have the silk mill vision a report on the the, the vision from that i just referred to as a report from we did with the, the National Trust as well. So lots of uh, different sizes of, of work, if you depending on how much time or interest that you've, you've got. Um, so in summary, as, as I say, I, I see the, the biodiversity crisis and um, the warming climate as symptoms of our broken relationship with nature. I think the nature connectedness approach is really powerful because it unites both human and nature's well-being together. And at a time where a lot of the discourse is on all the things that we've got, to, we've got to give up our cars and give up our gas boilers and and the like. I think 
in relationship with nature provides a very positive vision for a sustainable future of living with rather than living without. So, thank you very much. Um, are we going to move to questions? I don't know if we need this. Um, sorry? There are online questions. There are online questions. Well, we'll do in room questions first. That gentleman there, yes. And so, my question would be well, thank you for the presentation. What role? Sorry, we need this for the online people. So. <laughs> Sorry, um, is this working though? Uh, it's just for people online. All right. Um, yes. So, so my question would be, what role in this process of fostering uh, connectedness with nature do you see for policy, and and what could policymakers do to to do this? Because a lot of this seems quite voluntary, as in. It, you probably can't really force people to smell wildflowers, etc. So, so yeah, what can I, you do from I think the government? That's I'm I'm not a policymaker, so I'm. This is where I step into a world I'm not so familiar with. But we we do release policy briefings. That some of the guidance are policy briefings of our ideas. So, for example, in healthcare, um, one of the recommendations was to to make nature present in our models of of health and well-being so in the uk we have the five ways to well-being for example which is probably the most well-known um well-being guidance it doesn't mention nature at all so it could do and it should do um in health you can start to promote the the, the reality that a close relationship with nature can help manage your moods and keep your emotional regulation in balance which might help you stay well. So there's policy kind of ideas. Education, um, a, a, you can change the aims of education around developing people's close relationship with nature and bringing those pathways to inform the, the curriculum. Um, that's two areas. So there are, it is possible. And then urban design and uh, the design of places that prompt people use affordances and the principles like that to prompt people to engage and notice nature. There's potential potential for quite creative thinking around that. And on a cultural side, the funding that we put into the arts, perhaps some of that should be used for cultural events that celebrate our relationship with the natural world a little more. We're just going to take a question from online so I can say this in the microphone. Um, so this is an online question. Uh, does nature connectedness have any significant difference between temperate regions and tropical regions? And and I suppose I I would want to extend that to say, I mean, there's you've shown data largely from the West, yeah. um, and so I wonder if you can comment on areas where, you know, there are there is more climate change, climate migration, yeah, yeah. poverty, yeah. etc. I sadly, well, there is some data, but I've not got my hands on it yet. There's 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 a survey um, of a nature connectedness across a, over a hundred nations, I think, that Gallup conducted, and I'm I'm hoping to to be able to access that data to to look at that. Um, so it is limited at the minute. There are um, papers that the the, um, the psychometric scales have been translated into various languages, so it's starting to happen, but we don't know. As much as would be really nice to know what the if you if you could look at people's individual levels of nature connectedness across a hundred nations and look at those big factors, that would be really powerful information to to know. So that we're we're hoping to do to do that. But in that limited sample that we had, which was quite homogeneous, really, it was it's kind of generally European Western nations, as you say, there was a bit more nature connectedness in the more southern Europe. Uh, areas and we did find a, a relationship to things like rainfall and stuff not as big as biodiversity and other factors but i think clearly if it is part of it if you can get outside and spend more time outside and it's easier to have a culture of engaging in immersing yourself in that in that natural world yes as long as the natural world is a friendly well, world yes and that that's interesting as well isn't it though i mean i, I 
that it, it, that's not my area of, of of work. But I, I, there is a little bit in the book of people's relationship, um, for example, with tigers in India, and 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 yeah, that can be more positive than I might have thought it was. As I say, I'm quite naive to that. Got a question from Kim. Thanks. Um, so I do nature education with teenagers. <laughs> so obviously they're the tough crowd. Yeah. Um, I've been involved a little bit with the GCSE in natural history yeah. um, and I'm developing um, resources to teach that um, in due course with one of the local schools. Um, I was wondering whether you've been involved with that and what would be your recommendations for how we, for the design, I guess, overall of the yeah. GCSE? I, I was involved um at the very early stages of the GCSE natural history, Mary, who who um, got it got it through so well, um, invited me on to, to to comment on a few things. Um, I think, and perhaps Mary would admit herself, as it's gone through our system, our disconnected nature from system, it's become um, it's not as close as to the original vision perhaps now it's been through the exam boards and it, it's examinable and we can test the facts and figures and things so i think it's perhaps lost some of the the emotional cultural aspect that want, wanted to be in at the start but hopefully i'm, I'm not a, i'm not involved in the design of curriculum in schools at gcse level perhaps that can be brought back in uh in some ways because you can do a factual experience where you're surveying nature doesn't have to be purely factual you can bring in those pathways so you can bring in the emotional side the awe and wonder of, of what you might be observing uh, and emphasize those while you're doing the 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 core content that's got to be done so I, I would turn to those pathways to try and press buttons around sensory contact uh, noticing the joy and calm that that nature brings while you're um, doing the kind of more scientific work and the meaning of 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 nature to you as well. <laughs> right. Um, so I had a question. Many of the examples that you gave uh, and the interventions of both interventions and measurements were very individualistic. So focused yeah. on individuals. Uh, people and their relationship to nature through volunteering and things like that. Um, many of our kind of systems of meaning making, like how we have meaning and and some of the other kind of, um, uh, I can't remember what they're called, five pathways to nature connection are actually fostered through communities yep. um, and are, <clears throat> are collective. Um, so just to give a, a tricky example, if you took, uh, have you have you done much work looking at collectives and nature co connection and how that's created through collectives uh specifically thinking about things like relational values and how uh relationships to nature um shape collective identity and i'll give you the example of fishers or fisher people or fisher folk um and also relatedly if we take that example of fish folk are they nature connected but maybe they have do they have detrimental effects on biodiversity potentially but they also nature connected so yeah how does that all yeah, work we yeah. we've not done so much on communities i suppose we've been very focused on that psychological kind of construct of nature connectedness and and as i say it's gone from one paper that used the term and so we've been we've been part of that kind of very much focused on on the individual and measuring it at the individual level but I think that's part of our scaling up where we're getting community visions of what a close relationship with, with nature um, looks like. And I, I think in some ways we're moving away from the focus on nature connectedness. That's we've, we've established some really useful things to find out at the individual level, but we want to kind of grow because it's got to happen at community scale. But basically we need more nature connected communities rather than nature connected individuals. But obviously there's a, there's a link between the two. 
This is a question from online, uh, which is, could you say something a, a little bit more about how nature connectedness is measured, what the indicators are, what kinds of questions are asked? Or since that's probably a long um, yeah. and involved answer, perhaps you could point us to some papers where the, the measurement is, is yeah. detailed. So there's about a dozen um, measures of nature connectedness, all psychometric scales. The, the key, a really useful paper that compares them all is by TAM, uh, T-A-M. Uh, I think that was 2013. So if you, if you do a Google Scholar search for, for TAM, nature connectedness, scales you'll find that where where um they're all compared um and they're measuring the same construct overall but they did they measured slightly each have got different questions in so they might talk about your emotional relationship they might talk about how nature's part of yourself or not um they might talk about where you go on what type of vacation that you like so they're they're, they're quite um varied some are a little bit esoteric so not so good for population measures and there's one um that's more objective so it's it looks at reaction times to nature words on the screen so that's that's quite interesting as well so that you can fire nature words up and, and look at people's response times as well which is not obviously not a psychometric scale but a, 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 a nice approach to take so most of the it sounds like most of these scales are subjective self-report yes yeah very much so so um Part of the world I live in is is in bioethics and philosophy. So, yeah, yeah. Um, one question we ask about self report and subjective um, report is: Well, what if people are mistaken? How do you know if people are are accurate in their in their self report on these indicators? Yeah, yeah. No, that's, uh, that's important to know. And I suppose you've got the um, the the online implicit association test, which correlates nicely with the, the psychometric measures so that that helps um but yeah there's, there's there's there could be some interesting research to be done there's there's a little bit um using fmri scanning for example to try and look at um more connected brain states which is kind of comes from the lsd type research and the, the um when you're the kind of when the self dissolves kind of thing which have got parallels so it'd be quite nice to do that type of work in more nature connected people or perhaps look at some parallels to when people are looking at bunches of flowers and things like that mm -hmm. and responses but yeah it, it, it would be good to do the final question from in the room i'm up to you <laughs> oh, we'll meet halfway <laughs> thank you very much so my question's about um direction of causal relationships and of course yeah, yeah. that's super difficult to measure yeah. in anything using observational data which inevitably you're yeah. having to apart from if you you can do very narrow experiments on outcomes such as yes as you said showing people pictures of pretty trees or whatever but that's um not necessarily very helpful in the broader scale so you mentioned a, a, a number of different kind of relationships and i noticed that most of the time you were very careful to avoid causal language although sometimes you lent towards somewhat causal yeah, language yeah. and i was wondering um so for example you mentioned a relationship between nature connectedness and how much what the environment was like around people i wonder about if you can say anything about your hypotheses about direction of causality there uh also the one about life satisfaction you you really you yeah, mentioned yeah. a positive relationship between life satisfaction and nature connectedness um and I'd like, yeah, just to hear your reflections on causality and also how you might go about unpicking that kind of causal relationship in more detail. Yeah, a lot of a lot of the work has been cross-sectional. There's there's um kind of enough of a body of um empirical work for the you know the systematic review that said that started to suggest there was causal links. I think in the mental health um side of things there's some empirical work that can start to suggest there's there's um there's some causal relationship um but it it's something that we're battling with at the minute is is um trying to unpick that um we're currently involved in a, a, a project connected treescapes project looking at the, the the future of uk treescapes and people's perception of treescapes and nature connection and well-being within that and we're finding the modeling of that very difficult to do because of the many different potential 
uh, relationships, kind of circular relationships almost. So, um, yeah, there's, as ever in research, there's more to be done on establishing the strength of those causal relationships. Um, but I think the reality is that it's there's a lot of kind of reciprocal relationships of where there's more nature, there might be more connection, but the people with more connection might seek out the more nature and it's very difficult to unpick. Okay, thanks. I think we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you very much oh, again you. for coming to speak with us. And there is, as I said, there is a reception now and you're all invited. There's drinks and snacks and some uh, books. And I think Miles will be happy to yeah, sign any books yeah, I'll, that I'll you might purchase. I'll thanks so. very much for coming. Crisp. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting. Um, it, it makes you think that if you have sort of a, you know, a really 